Well, it's good to see you all this morning. Well, I don't know why you guys are here. But I'm here because I believe the Lord wants to speak to your heart something. And so let's, let's look to the Lord for that. Let's pray. Father, this morning we want to dedicate ourselves to you. We want to recognize that your grace is enough. That it's greater than all of our sin. We want to surrender ourselves, Lord, to your will. We pray that you help us with that. We live in a world with conflicting desires that wish to hook us and take us. And Lord, we need to hear from you. We need to hear from your word about each one of our lives. I pray that you might help us, that we would see you, that you would help us in our minds and our hearts to be dedicated to you. So Lord, just have your way with us as your word is read. And as we talk about it, I pray that you might mold us more into the image of your son, Jesus Christ. We dedicate this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're back on track. We're in Genesis chapter 15, looking at the life of Abraham, or, or Abram as he's called right now. He's going to get a change of name later on, but we're going to look at the, Abra the Abrahamic covenant of which all of Israel is a beneficiary, and believe it or not, you are as well. And so as we look to that, <clears throat> we'll look back in Genesis chapter 11, we were looking at the initiation of God speaking to Abram, and he pulls him out of this Ur of the Chaldees, and he tells him, get away from your family, get away from your country, get away from everybody, and he drags his dad and his nephew with him, and he, he goes up river a little bit. And we see later on, there's a difficulty, and once he finally gets there, there's trouble, because there's a famine. And so now they finally get to the place where God's led them, and there's a famine. I don't know about you, but sometimes you feel like, wow, thanks, Lord. <laughs> you, get, you get to a place where you think he wants you, or maybe you've been saving for a new car for a long time, and you go buy that new car, and you get that new car, and you park it one time in the parking lot, and you come out, and it's, as far as you're concerned, it's ruined, because it's got a scratch, because somebody didn't put their card away, Right? And I imagine that's how it felt when he was called out and he finally got to where he was supposed to be, it ends up being a famine. So they leave and they go to Egypt. We realize that's not such a great thing because he goes to Egypt and he has to lie about who his wife is because she's apparently so beautiful that he's afraid he'll be murdered and they'll just take her as a consolation prize. Uh, but if he's her brother, then they have to negotiate with him. And so he thought that would be more advantageous. So he tells his wife to lie for him and say, you're my sister, which is kind of half true because she's like a half, she's a stepsister, a half sister. So then in chapter 13, we see Lot who he's been dragging around. They finally have such a problem when they get back to the promised land. They have too much stuff and they can't live together. For those of you that are married, it's not a good excuse to separate from your wife or your husband. <laughs> but They've got so much stuff, and God uses that friction to pull them apart so that Abram can do what God's called him to do, and, and Lot decides he's going to go into this well-watered plain of Sodom. Uh, we know is not such a great choice later on. Last week, we talked about how Abram had to go and rescue Lot because there were four kings in the north that came and invaded these five kings along the, the valley, the, the Jordan Valley, and took everything, wives, children, stuff, just destroyed everything and left. And Abram heard about this and he said, oh no, you don't, that's my nephew. And he gets 318 armed guards from his own household. That's a big household right there. 318 trained soldiers and he's got, a, he's got a couple of guys on either side of him who say, yeah, yeah. And they decide to join him and they go and they rescue Lot. They rescue all the stuff. We know Melchizedek shows up and he brings out wine and bread, which is rather, rather interesting. And so we talked about Melchizedek. These five southern kings invaded by the four northern kings and how there were tar pits where people fell into and actually died in part of this. And so Abram gets all of this stuff back and he chases them all the way back up north where they came from. And then he takes all of his 
stuff and he goes back and he's distributing to everyone as, uh, you know, the people that belong in those cities and he's giving everything back. And this guy shows up, Melchizedek, this king of righteousness, but he's also a priest of the most high God. He's a priest and a king. And we looked at how the scripture separates those two, the tribe of Levi and the tribe of Jude. The tribe of Judah, would, the scepter would not depart from Judah is the prophecy given that they would be the leaders and the Levites would be the priests. You don't mix and match. And when you do, there's, God will smack you down for it. I realize I use vernacular that's not biblical, but you get it, right? Okay, good. If I get too gutter, just let me know. He brings out wine and bread, and we see that in a couple of places. We see that certainly at the, the Last Supper when Jesus is there in the, in the Passover. There's bread and there's wine. And then there's one other time when it's kind of mentioned, and it's with Joseph, because there's a cupbearer and there's a baker. And the cupbearer gets restored, which is after three days, which is an interesting three days. And then the baker ends up getting hung up on a pole interesting how both of those things speak of Jesus Christ and point to his sacrifice, which would be made much, much later as we look at Joseph. So he's a priest of the Most High God, and the scripture says that there would be another priest that would come that would be in the line of Melchizedek. Now, because you don't know where he came from or you don't know what happened to his family because he's kind of this man of mystery, Jesus shows up and he is a, a priest like unto Melchizedek, which actually he came from heaven. So it's all foreshadowed, priests and kings. And the only third category of people that are priests and kings are you and I, because we're a royal priesthood, it says in Peter. So God has called you to be his princesses and princes, but he's also called you to be a priest, which means we intercede before God on behalf of others. That's what a priest does. A prophet speaks to others on behalf of God, and a priest speaks to God on behalf of people. You got that? I'm going to quiz you later. And so he brings everything back, and the, the, the king of Sodom says, listen, I want to just give you all the stuff. You can have the stuff. And he, and, but I'll take the people back to their town where they, where they belong. And he says, I'm not taking a penny from you because I know what you're going to do. You're going to say, oh, Abram's rich because I made him rich. I don't want it. Because uh, beware of gifts, because they all have strings sometimes, depending on who's giving them, right? A million stories, sorry. Like your mother-in-law comes over and says, hey, where's that Christmas sweater I gave you last year? I didn't see you wearing it. There's strings attached to gifts. You got to watch. So, so Abram does in response as he gives thanks and he gives a tenth to Melchizedek, and it's interesting how that foreshadows the tenth that's going to be given to the priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, those who follow after Aaron. And so we looked at all of this last week. If you don't remember any of this, it's because you were asleep. And it's interesting because he offers them all the stuff, and he won't take the stuff, and, and uh, he's going to take the people. The devil does that, doesn't he? He says, listen, I want you to forget about all the people in your life. Just concentrate on stuff. Just concentrate on things, you know, working hard, putting in the overtime when you can get it, making a lot of money, making an estate, getting an extra property, maybe a brand new car. How about a helicopter? No more traffic. Yeah. Take the stuff. No, I'm not taking the stuff because there are strings attached to it and it's better to be a hermit for God than it is to live in a castle without him. And so he doesn't take any of the stuff and he just moves on from there. And we looked at how Jesus did that and how he gave everything for us and how we're called to do that because we're recipients of his grace. So that was last week. So this week we're going to look at Abram, actually God cutting a covenant. And, uh, you know, to, it's cutting a covenant because there's some cutting involved. Um, instead of making an agreement or we would say we're going to make a contract or we're going to draw up a mortgage or something of that nature, this is what a covenant is. And we're going to take a look at that. After these things, after the war where he goes and he rescues Lot and all of these things that happened, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision saying, do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your exceeding great reward. It seems like an interesting thing that God would come after a great victory like that and say, don't be afraid. I shall be your shield in other words, to be protecting of you, and I'll be your great reward. 
He just denied taking a reward for doing everything he just did. So the Lord says, I'll be your reward. And he says, I will be your shield. The Lord will protect him. So don't worry about it because you see, Abram just made a bunch of enemies, didn't he? He went out and he and his family and a couple of his neighbors routed these five kings who decimated the, the, uh, the four kings that decimated the five kings. So he's just made some enemies of his neighbors. Maybe he wasn't thinking about that. I got some people ticked off at me. So why would the Lord say, don't be afraid, I'll be your shield and your reward? Because he didn't get a reward, he refused it, and he did this because he made a covenant before God to do so. And he's now worried, maybe I ticked off my neighbors, maybe they're going to come knocking on my door at midnight. So the Lord comes and says, don't you worry about that. After a great victory, <laughs> there exists the possibility of great failure. You guys know what I'm talking about? You ever go on vacation and come home to a disaster? You ever go on vacation and go back to work and walk into a great disaster? Okay, some of you understand. Okay. Sometimes after a great victory, there can be some difficulty uh, on the downside of that, and we tend to be made that way. And there are a couple of examples from the scriptures. If you know about Elijah, Elijah goes and it's this throwdown with the, the, the prophets of Baal. And he's like, well, if your God is real, then have him bring some fire down on this sacrifice to show his approval. And of course, they cut themselves. They scream out to Baal. Baal doesn't answer because Baal ain't home. He's not there. He doesn't exist. And so he says, okay, and they make the sacrifice and they douse it with water and they douse it with more water and they douse it with more water. And then he calls out to God and he says, hey, God, show yourself. And this flame comes and it devours up the water and takes the sacrifice and makes a fire. And then Elijah says, here we go. And he took out the sword and he goes, you guys are all a bunch of hypocrites. And he takes their heads off. It's a great, great victory. you got all these demonic dudes who are cutting themselves and trying to cry out to a God that doesn't exist and he doesn't answer, your God's false and you, you're propagating a false narrative, if you will, fake news, taking you out. So he takes them all out and then of course, Queen Jezebel finds out and he says, may my life be like theirs if I don't make you dead like them this time tomorrow. And then he goes, oh no, I'm in trouble. And he runs away like a scared child. He runs into a cave. He goes under a bush and he says, Lord, just take me home. It's enough. I'm retiring officially from being a prophet. I'm done with life. Just take my life. He crawls up under a bush and he's waiting to die and an angel comes and feeds him and says, listen, you got you to gotta eat and drink because you got you gotta, a journey ahead of you. And he finally gets to a cave and, and the Lord is announcing himself outside, getting his attention. He comes out and after he shows the wind and the fire and the, the earthquake and all that, and the Lord wasn't in any of it, but he was in a still small voice at the end. And he goes, what are you doing here, Elijah? What are you doing here? It's interesting. He had this mountaintop experience. He had this great defeat. And then suddenly he was afraid for his life and he ran away. I see it a principle that runs through the scripture that after great victories, there can be great sorrow. There can be a, a letdown, if you will. Um, it, happens, it happens all the time, and I don't need to tell you. You've probably experienced it my, yourself. I think about Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah, Nebuchadnezzar is this big guy in Babylon, and he's got you know Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Daniel, and they're captive and all of that. Well, he has a dream. He has a dream of this statue and he keeps having this dream and it's all freaking him out and he doesn't know what it means. So he asks his wise men, these Chaldeans, hey, what's this dream mean? They go, well, tell us the dream. We'll tell you what it means. He goes, no, it's not going to be that easy. You got to tell me the dream too. And they said, well, there's no one that can do that. He goes, well, then you're useless. I'm going to kill you all. Because he's Nebuchadnezzar. He can do that. And so Daniel hears about this and he says, listen, don't, don't kill them all. Give me a minute. And check with God. God knows what's going on. And so he checks with God and God tells him what it is. He says, what you saw was this giant statue. He's like, yeah, the top of it was gold. Yeah, that's right. And the 
mid portion, the bust of it was silver. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right, that's right. And there was bronze from there down, and it's and in the two feet it ended in clay and mingled with rock as it went down. And then there was this giant stone that was hewn without hands. It came from the sky and, and bashed it all, and it all fell down. He goes, "Yes, that's my dream. What does it mean?" He says, "There's a God in heaven who could tell you what it is. So, so I'll tell you what it is. You are the head." You're Nebuchadnezzar. Your kingdom is gold, and the silver is the next couple of kingdoms. And he goes all the way to down, and, and there's this rock that comes from heaven that destroys it all, and it's basically the end of all the kingdoms of the world. And that's Jesus Christ, by the way. He's the one who's going to come again and will destroy all the kingdoms of the world. And after this, the very next chapter, after he hears from God, and he gets the answer he needs. He builds a giant statue of himself. And he requires everyone to bow down and worship it. What? You were just so scared for your life, you were going to kill all your wise men. And Daniel, this, this Hebrew slave that you have, he comes and, and defines it for you. If I were you, I'd be a little more humble. But he kind of overshoots. And there's another time when Nebuchadnezzar says, you know, look, look at this kingdom that I have. Look at all that I've built. And the Lord says, uh, uh, uh. And he makes him like an animal for seven years. His fingernails got long. His hair got long. He didn't shave. He was ratty for seven years. That's a long time. And then he comes back and finally the Lord gives him sense and he goes, listen, God of Daniel, he's the real God. But we need to be humble. But I see this gyration that happens. We have these high points and these great victories and these wonderful things. And then what happens is there's usually disaster on the other side of it. So uh, he's not the only one. I think about the disciples. The disciples as they were on the Mount of Transfiguration when Jesus took uh, Peter, James, and John. Uh, they were the special head crew. He had to keep a close eye on. And they went up with him. And Jesus is revealed in all of his glory, brighter than the sun. They can't look at him. And he's up there with Moses and Elijah, having a conversation about what's going to happen. Jesus is heading to Jerusalem to die. And Peter, struck by this, says, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let's build three booths and we'll just stay up here. And God the Father has to show up in a cloud and say, hey, this is my father. This is my son. Listen to him. <laughs> and they looked up from where they were, and suddenly everything was back to normal. Jesus said, come on, we got to go. And so they go down the mountain, they get at the bottom of the mountain, and there's this kid who's possessed by a demon. And his parents bring him to the disciples, and immediately Jesus is hit with all these complaints. Your disciples don't work. There's something faulty with them, because they can't cast this demon out. And they, they complain, and they say all the things that's going on. Jesus asks a couple of questions, and he casts the demon out, and the demon's gone. And the disciples are like, well, what, what's going on here? You know, we couldn't do it. The amazing thing is they had this wonderful mountaintop experience where they saw the Lord, and they come down, and suddenly there's all this mess going down in the bottom of the hill. I noticed that those high spots and those low spots tend to be close to each other. Have you noticed that? I'm going to have a great vacation. It'll be wonderful. Well, you know, when you come back, you know, your faucet broke, your house is flooded, you know, like something happened. Don't be surprised. Use those times to be fortified so when those things happen, you don't lose it. So also the disciples, what am I doing? You see, every once in a while I mess up. I think I'm on number 12 today. I think about Peter, who was called out of the boat. And Jesus called him out of the boat, and he was walking on the water. I would say that's a pretty big high point in someone's life, if they can walk on water, right? And he begins to look around, and he begins to realize, hey, I'm doing the impossible. I shouldn't be able to do this. <laughs> and down he goes, to the point where Jesus has to reach down and pull him back up. And he was like, you were doing well. What happened? Jersey version. What happened? What's wrong with you? He began to look at the wind and the waves, and he wasn't looking at Jesus. And it's the same thing that happens to us, isn't it? So I see sometimes great victories are followed by depression sometimes, or uh, great disappointment, or great challenges. And so 
after this great victory, the Lord comes to comfort Abram and say, listen, you don't have to worry about people finding you or putting a hit on you or any of that kind of bananas. I'm going to be your shield and I will be your great reward. I think about another one with Peter when they were at the Last Supper and Jesus said, one of you is going to betray me. And they all to the man said, not me, not me, no way, no way, Lord, not me. And Peter said, listen, if everybody leaves you, I will never leave you. And he made himself very loud. And he says, yeah, you're going to deny me three times by the time morning comes, when you hear the cock crow three times. You're, you're going to deny me three times. And that's exactly what he does. And on the third, Jesus made eye contact with Peter because he was at the place where this was happening. And he ran out and he wept bitterly. These big attestations, I, I, I picture Peter being a big, big man for lots of reasons. But he's making these big, hey, I'm going to, I'll never leave you, Jesus. No way. I'm your man. You know, I'll always back you up. And then he fails three times. Once to a little servant girl. He won't admit that he knows Jesus. And I see that sometimes great mountaintop experiences are followed by great disaster. So I think that's why the Lord came to Abram. <clears throat> and Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless. So he's going right to the great reward part. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And then Abram said, look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is to be my heir. So the Lord says, I'm going to be your shield and your reward. He goes, what's a reward? What's that mean? Because I've got nobody to leave it to. At this point, he's like 80 years old. And God promised previously that he would have an heir. He would have descendants, right? And now he's telling him again. And it's interesting how Abram says, God, you're going to be my shield and my great reward. What about a kid? Remember that thing you promised me? You ever talk to God like that? What about this here? And it's interesting how God allows this to happen to hear his heart. I, I thank God that he hears my heart. He hears your heart without any judgments like you and I might make. You thankless, worthless human being. Where's that lightning bolt? Where'd I leave it? You know, it, it's not like that. And Abram sounds like he's complaining, but he's challenging God on his word. You know, you can do that because his word is true all the time. And he fulfills his promises all the time. And you don't have to think you're going to get God mad. Listen, I've yelled at God. I've shaken my fist at God. I've blamed God for things. He's forgiven me, apparently, because I'm still here. Well, he says, all I have is this Eliezer. By the way, Eliezer means God is my help or helper. Um, it's rather interesting, this servant who's going to be unnamed later who chooses a bride. He's this unnamed servant, and that'll come in later when we get to, to Isaac. But he says, what, what about a kid? I, I'd really like that. That would be great. An heir, somebody I can give this to instead of my servant who was born in my house. Sometimes God will reveal and refine the desire of our hearts before he provides for our desires. Sometimes he will intensify and refine a desire that's in your heart because he wishes to satisfy it. I think about Adam. He creates Adam, everything's good, except Adam's alone. He says, it's not good that man is alone. And he says, I will make a helper fit for him. And then he brought him all the animals. It's like pausing for a commercial almost. And all of the animals go before him. And whatever he called it, that's what he named. Okay, you're an elephant because you got a big long nose. You're a rhino because you got a... You're a male and female giraffe and a male and female, a male and female. Everything's male and female except there is no suitable helper for me. You see, God revealed and refined his need so that he realized he had a need. So when the woman showed up, he goes, what's she doing here? I don't need her. I don't need anybody except for this lamp. I, you know, I, it, it's not like that. He refines these desires and brings it to the place where you now know that you have a need and it's a deep need. And God does that on purpose sometimes. 
So when you get to the place where you're ready to actually pray about the thing instead of complain about the thing, it might be that gets exactly what God's trying to do, get you to pray. In Jeremiah 29, 12, and 13, you guys all know 29, 11, right? I know the thoughts that I have for you. You guys know it. I'm sure you have it at home, hung on a wall somewhere. Well, these are the other two verses. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. God says, when you seek with all your heart. You see, these desires get revealed and refined by God to the place where, okay, now when I answer this, this is not going to be an inconvenience or some thankless gift that's given to you. It's going to be something that you're truly appreciative for. I grew up poor. I used to pick garbage. I'm still a garbage picker. I, I drive by garbage. I'm like, I just do. I drive by dumpsters. Uh, you know, I'm looking over the top. I, I have no need. I need nothing. But I, I, I'm always on the hunt. Somebody's going to throw something out really good that I, that I need. Uh, I love flea markets. I, I love getting deals. I go on eBay. I look for stuff. I don't buy very much because I don't need much. But when there's a deep desire and you do without things and you finally have something that you're very invested in, you take care of it. It's like, you know, kids say, Dad, I need some cash. Here's 100. And they walk away. Like, they don't even say thank you. They just walk away and blow it all. And they're coming back for more. That's because you didn't work for it. You work for it, and that $100 represents X amount of hours of sweat. I don't think I want to spend it so quickly. <laughs> it's a good thing to learn. It's a good thing to teach. It's... I'm so glad that God didn't give me everything I want and he made me wait because I wouldn't appreciate it. I wouldn't be thankful for it. We tend to take things for granted and not be thankful, so we got to make a day, one day a year, where we generate thankfulness. I pray every day would be Thanksgiving for us. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him saying, this one shall not be your heir. So Eliezer's not going to be the guy. But one who will come from your own body. Now, like I said, he's in his 80s, right? He shall be your heir. And then he brought him outside and he said, look now toward the heaven and count the stars if you're able and number them. And he said to him, so shall your descendants be. And he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. How many of you know that last verse? And he counted him for righteousness. It's actually in the New Testament. It is the floor plan for how God behaves with human beings. He wants us to believe him. Well, that seems simple. But try to believe in a God you have never seen face to face. Don't you find that difficult sometimes? until you build a track record of God answering your prayers, and then it, then it becomes a whole lot easier, right? It's like a muscle that you exercise. Eventually, eh, I, I can do this. So he comes to him and he says, listen, like the stars of the sky, you know how many stars you can see with the naked eye? Usually two in New Jersey. That's about it. <laughs> there are between 12 and 1,400 stars that you can see in a clear night with the naked eye. That's a lot of counting. And I imagine if he actually tried, oh, I think I counted that before. I got to start again. One, two. You know, I, I think that would be a problem. But you get the idea. You see the stars? That's how many offspring you're going to have. So don't, don't worry that you're not going to have an heir. You're going to have tons and tons. And because he is the first one who believes God and it's accredited to him for righteousness. In other words, he put it on his account that he did the right thing, and now, there, now he has a relationship with Abram. Abram becomes the father of every faithful person, every person that exercises faith in Jesus Christ and what God has done. He's the first guy that ever believed God, and it's accredited to him for righteousness before he ever does a thing. He doesn't do anything other than believe God. This whole having faith in God being enough 
that started a long time ago in the Old Testament. It started with Abram. By the way, he was uncircumcised, which means he didn't do anything. I mean, he didn't do anything that the Old Testament is going to service and say you have to do. And yet God accredited righteousness to him. You know what righteousness means? It means being dressed rightly. Wow, I didn't get that from the word righteousness, but that's what it means. In Genesis 13, 16, he told him this earlier, and I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth so that a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants could also be numbered. So he said this before. God's just saying, I guess he didn't get it. I have to use another, you know, metaphor. And so he says the stars. And it's interesting, Jesus teaches like that too, right? He's in a field and he says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. And he says, look at the birds of the air. They don't toil or spin. He uses all these wonderful examples. If, if you're a teacher in any way, shape, or form, it's good to use what you have around you, right? Anyway, so it spoke to me. Huh? And the stars happen to be there. And in Genesis 22, 17 to 18, the Lord says again, blessing I will bless you and multiplying, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven, so he repeats it, and as the sand in which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. By the way, who's he talking about? In your seed. Notice it's not seeds. He didn't say descendants. He said seed. Jesus is the seed who comes. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now he's blessing him later in chapter 22 because of obedience. But previously, it was just because he believed him period. There's righteousness attributed to him because he believed. God doesn't want you to be a good person because it's not good enough. God doesn't want you to hurt yourself, sacrifice, do penance. He doesn't want any of that. He just wants you to believe him. Can you do that? You would think, you would think it's such an easy thing just to believe what God says. Well, first of all, you got to open the book and see what he said before you can believe what he says. But it's faith. We are saved by grace through faith. And that's not of ourselves. It is a gift of God so that nobody can boast. It is a gift from God. But then we need to exercise that faith, don't we? Even as Abram does. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If you want to increase your faith, you know what to do, right? Just read the word. He believed the Lord and he accredited it to him as righteousness. And they said to him, John 6, 28, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may do, that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God that you believe in him who he sent. And who's that? That's Jesus. So Jesus boiled it down. I say, listen, what do we have to do? to be right with God. Well, you gotta believe in the one whom he sent. That seems simple, right? If you ever have to share the gospel with somebody, you could get into like a big, complicated explanation. Or you could just keep it really simple and said to do the will of God is to believe in the one whom he sent, who's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Messiah. Right? Any of you ever doubt your salvation? Don't raise your hands. You should all be raising your hands. At some point, you say, I, I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not feeling it. You know, I don't. Listen, I have to look at the scripture and believe the scripture against sometimes how I feel. Because I know it's true. And how I feel isn't. And that's what it is to be a Christian. It's I've given my life to believe what God said. And I'm going to put my trust in what he said, not how I feel. Because how I feel changes all the time, moment by moment, as you can see. Faith. Doing the works of God is believing in him whom he has sent. John 3.16, we're all very familiar with. Pay careful attention to the highlighted words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes. Well, I got to go to church every Sunday. I got to go to prayer meeting on Wednesday. I got to Thursday night's Bible study, men's breakfast on Saturday. I gotta... No, believe. 
It may involve doing all that other stuff, but you better believe first. That whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, like the world thinks. But the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned. And he who does not believe is condemned already. By the way, you're not condemned because you sin. You're condemned because you're a sinner and you sin. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It, it's boiled down very, very simply. It's faith in what God has said and whom he sent. Make sense? Good. I'm glad you're all with me. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees, Chaldeans and give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know that I will inherit it? What? Yeah, this is the next verse. How can I be sure? How can I know? And so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. Now, I'm sure you've read through this before and you've never seen it look so ironic. Abram, not sure that God's going to do what he said he's going to do. And he says, how can I be sure of this? And he goes, I know. I'll make a lamb. I'll make a recipe. This is what you need to do. <laughs> Go get me a heifer, uh, which, is, which is a large cow. Um, Go get a she-goat and get a male goat and bring me a pigeon and... A turtle dove. It doesn't sound like a Thanksgiving recipe I'm familiar with. A turducken is about the closest thing that I can say, which is, a, you know, a turtle. No. So, anyway. Yeah, I know what it is. I'm playing. Here. So he asked for all this stuff. Now, how would you be? You say, God, all right, this is the second time you're telling me you're going to do this. You told me to count dust and you told me to count the stars. And how can I be sure? Do you see how patient God is with Abram? Now, he's the father of the faithful because he believed God and it was accredited to him in righteousness. But he says, how can I be sure? Sounds like you and me. He sounds a lot like you and me. I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. Like in Mark chapter 9, 23 and 24, Jesus says to this man, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried and he said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. You ever feel that way? Like I, I know what God said and, and I know his word is faithful, but I just don't feel like it's gonna happen. How can I be sure? What you need to do is go get a heifer <laughs> and a she-goat and a male goat, and you need to get a pigeon and a turtle dove, okay? So this is what you have to do. Now see, Abram knows what's going on. You and I have no clue. We think he's gonna make a recipe, including all these elements. He's getting ready to make a contract. He's drawing up a, a contract or a covenant. It's like, if you were gonna buy a house, you gotta go get a lawyer, you gotta get somebody to transfer, you gotta do a research on the thing, make sure nobody else has any claims on the property, and it all has to be drawn up. Well, this is how they made, co this is how they made covenants or contracts in the Old Testament. They would take these animals and they would cut them in half and lay them out. And then the people who were making a covenant with one another, like if you and I, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm going to do this thing or I'm going to buy this house or whatever, you know, and I will pay you back. What you do is you cut all these animals out and you walk with this person through these parts, kind of in a figure eight style. And you guys talk about what it is that you're going to do and all the promises. And so as you're walking on this bloody path and you're walking around these dead animals, it's like, listen, if I don't do what I'm saying I'm going to do, I should be dead like these guys very dramatic, right? It's very dramatic. But see, Abram understands what the Lord's going to do. He's like, aha, we're going to cut a contract. We're going to cut a covenant. And so he gathers all of these animals. By the way, there are five very specific sacrifices in Leviticus. 
five of them, and you'll recognize some of these animals on it. Actually, the animals don't get cut in half, the, the birds. You just kind of <laughs> crack their neck, and it's all over. And then one's on one side, one's on the other. So they have this nice aisle of four. You know, there's four things and four things. Anyway. In Jeremiah, it's actually referred to this making of a covenant and cutting a covenant. It says, and I will give the men who have transgressed my covenant, who have not performed the words of the covenant in which they made before me, when they cut the calf in two and pass between the parts of it, the princes of Judah, the princes of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who pass between the parts of the calf, I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their life. Their dead bodies shall be for meat for the birds of heaven and the beasts of the earth. That's why in the New Testament, it says, Jesus says, you should not ever swear because God takes that stuff seriously. You shouldn't swear by heaven because that, you don't, you, you know, that's God's throne and you shouldn't swear by the temple and you shouldn't swear by the gold and you shouldn't swear by, you shouldn't swear anything because you don't, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, right? Hey, I'll see you tomorrow at two o'clock. How often does that happen? How many of you are on time all the time? See, that's what I'm saying. You can't swear anything. You can't be sure of anything because life has a way of making it difficult. Like uh, the other day, there was a big accident on 36 and a lot of people couldn't get through and get here on time. You know, I could have said, aha, you're late. You know, why would you do that? Because you yourself suffer from the same issue. You live in this world. God says, if you make a covenant before me and you don't do it, you're going to be like the animals that you just walked through. Okay, so this is just a, a recording of uh, this kind of a contract that gets pulled. And then he brought all of these to him and he cut them in two down the middle and he placed each piece opposite the other but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. So he's got this big mess. And now the birds of the air are suddenly catching wind of what's going on. And so they're going to swoop in and dive down on this. But he's in the middle of cutting a contract with God. He's waiting for God to show up. Because you can't cut a contract by yourself. You have to cut a contract with the person you're making a contract with. And God is the one making the covenant, right? So he's waiting for God to show up. By the way, in the past, he did show up and he spoke to him. So he has reason to believe that God's going to show up. But sometimes we do everything that God says and he doesn't seem to show up. It actually takes between 24 and 48 hours for vultures to be able to find carrion or dead animals. They can smell for miles. They can smell blood. It's an amazing thing. Well, they're the cleanup crew. You know, God's equipped them. They're good. So you get all these animals that are coming around and Abram's like shooing them away and, and keeping the vultures away. And, you know, you're, you're over here and, you know, they're trying to pick up your turtle dove and take off. And, you know, it, you can imagine all of the mess. He's trying to make a covenant with God and God doesn't seem to show up right away. And so it involves some patience. And I think his faith is tested at this. And he's now chasing away these birds. It's interesting how God uses symbols throughout the scripture very specifically. And very often birds are an, uh, a form of the enemy. Uh, you know who that is, right? He says, you know, it's like, it's like uh, the the... the the man who went and scattered seed and some of it fell on the path and the birds of the air came and took it away. And he said, that's like Satan who comes and takes that word away so that the people don't believe. So there are times when Jesus refers to the birds of the air and they're not necessarily good things. Uh, in this example, certainly they're against him. They are creepy looking things. But it's amazing how they don't really have any feathers on their head because they put themselves into uh, dead things. And, uh, you know, you don't want to pick up undue bacteria. Anyway, now, when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. He's had a busy day of aerobics, you know, <laughs> scaring away the birds. And behold, horror and great darkness 
fell upon him. And then he said to Abram, now certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them. And they will afflict them 400 years. And also the nation whom they serve, I will judge. Afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. It's a very complicated contract that God is drawing up here suddenly. Thought it was going to be a real simple thing, but he gives him all of this information. Not only are you going to have children, they're going to have children and you're going to become this nation. They're going to be held captive in Egypt for 400 years until they're released and then they'll come back to this land. God gives him way more information than what he was wanting. He probably want, wanted to know, is it a boy or a girl and when? You know, I got to get the room ready. got to paint it. You know, wish I knew it was blue or pink, you know, so... And God gives him all of this prophecy, all of this advanced knowledge of what's going to happen. And it's interesting because if you remember, the, the, the Lord took these guys and purified them as they were in the desert. It's a rather interesting story, uh, the captivity of Israel. But he gives them all of this information and he says, but I'm not going to do this yet because the sin of the Amorites is not quite filled up. It's almost like there's, there's a level of sin that goes up and then at this point, there's a buzzer that goes off. God says, okay, enough. Like Sodom and Gomorrah, enough. I just don't know when that's gonna be for America. He says the sin of the Amorites, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. And by the way, when you see God tell them to go in, Joshua go into the land and take everybody out. You don't realize they've had 400 years to repent and they didn't. That's patience. I waited for 400 years before I, before I came and took, uh, you know, took my vengeance. Verse 17, and it came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark that behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. On the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying to your descendants, I have given this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. I rehearsed. God said, I'm making a covenant with you, but instead of walking through the pieces with Abram, he goes by himself. God makes a unilateral covenant, a one-sided covenant. It has nothing to do with what Abram needs to do on his end, right? I like covenants like that. Somebody says, I will do this, and you don't have to do anything. Oh, I like that. God himself walks through the blood, and he does it and Abraham does not. That's what Jesus did. Jesus sacrificed his own body and shed his own blood for us. And it's a one-sided covenant, but we have to respond. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, you see, there's a condition. There has to be a belief. There has to be a following. Well, it's interesting. You have all of these animals, and now finally it's nighttime, and he's don't know if he's in a dream state, don't know if he's seeing a vision or if he's waking up and now he's seeing this. But this pot, this smoking pot, it, it goes through with a torch and the, the pot has this big tower of smoke that's coming off of it. And there's the, this fire, this torch that goes through. What's that all about? You don't know either? When we see God's appearances like at the bush in Sinai, he appears like fire. And yet the bush is not burned up. And that's what gets Moses' attention. We see when they get delivered from Egypt and they come through, God reveals himself as a pillar of smoke in the daytime and a flame of fire, a tower of fire in the daytime. Oh, I'm sorry, the fire at night and the cloud in the day. 
So God reveals himself, and there are these symbols, these imageries that he continues to use. And so we see that uh, when Solomon inaugurated the temple, the temple filled with smoke to the point where everybody had to leave, and it wasn't smoke they made. It was actually God's presence, this Shekinah glory of God. And so he shows himself, and it's interesting because this pot isn't like, you know, somebody's cooking something up. You know, you might have that on your mind because of Thanksgiving. It's not something, it's a refiner's pot where you would purify gold or silver or something of that nature. You would put a fire underneath it. The impurities would inevitably rise to the top. You scoop them off and then you have a pure metal. It's the symbol that Israel's going to suffer. This covenant with all of his descendants involve a purification process. And so there's this pot with smoke and there's this fire because God is always represented by fire in so many places in the scripture. So God makes a one-sided covenant with Abram and says, I'm going to do this. And the ones that are for you, I'll be for, and the ones that are against, I'll be against. That's why it scares me when I start to hear America pulling away from Israel. Because God says, this land is theirs, including what they call Palestine all the way to the river Euphrates. By the way, have you seen the Euphrates lately? It's drying up. I mean, it's, it's really drying up. Now, if you know anything about prophecy, you know that there's going to be an army that comes over the Euphrates and goes right into Jerusalem. I think it's very interesting that these things are happening. You would never think of a river drying up. But the scripture says the river will dry up and then there'll be an army that goes over the top of it. Anyway, never mind. <laughs> Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 10, gives us kind of a sum up of what's going on with Abram. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go to the place in which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in a land of promise, as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob. That's coming later their heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. In other words, Abram never got so attached to this world and the stuff of this world that he forsook God. He looked forward to being with the Lord. He looked forward to this wonderful city that God builds instead of getting so enamored down here which is the opposite of what Lot does. Lot gets very tied in down here, and we're going to see that in the upcoming chapters. So there's Abram, and he gets this vision from the Lord and this promise from God. Next week, we're going to look at Sarai and Hagar, and this wonderful idea that his wife has, say, hey, God seems to be taking a little longer than we anticipated. Why don't we make this thing happen? Don't do it. <laughs> if you think you know what the Lord wants, wait for the right time when the Lord causes it to happen. Don't force it, because there are some things that get broken that can't be repaired. Amen?